Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, we're deliberately starting a little bit early because, uh, quite frankly, after the uh, regimental sergeant major got your attention and you're all nicely quiet, we might as well get underway. And thank you very much for being with us. For those who've made the effort to be with us in a particularly difficult weather day, uh, thank you. And uh, our heartfelt sympathy goes out to those people who are just dealing with some very extreme problems at the moment. I'd like to again welcome you. I'm the president of Roosie, New South Wales. My name is Michael Howe. I'd just like to pay our respects, particularly to the elders who are accountable and responsible as, as custodians. And uh, I'd also like to particularly pay tribute to First Nations people who are serving in the ADF. We'd like to thank them for their service. Uh, you can see my mugshot when released. I'm the president of Rusi New South Wales. And interestingly, um, as president, I have a deliberate choice of a slightly non-traditional president. You will notice that I present myself as Professor Michael Howe rather than my retired military rank because we're actually trying to give a message that is, Rusi is not necessarily just simply for retired military people who feel they have nothing else to do. Uh, no offence intended, but it's actually fairly accurate. Um, a warm welcome. Could I particularly acknowledge and thank our two senior RAAF officers who will be presenting today and they will be correctly and properly introduced uh, by Ron in just a few moments. I'd particularly like to speak only once and so what I'd like to do is to very quickly run through the programs that we've got coming up. We would appreciate you noting what they are. Please try to support us by attending. And so, other things that we'd like to point out to you today. If you've not had a chance to look at the Anzac Memorial, could we commend that to you? And in particular, in our Ursula Davidson Library is the special RAAF 100th anniversary celebration book in which every day we turn the page and honour another person who served in World War II in the Royal Australian Air Force. The only other copy is laid up in the Anglican Cathedral uh, in Sydney and it's a truly historic uh, commemorative recognition of those who served. And if you haven't seen it, could I invite you to visit the library and have a look. Could I point out to you that the uh, Anzac Memorial is celebrating the RAF 100th. We'd love to see you if you could help us in some kind of way. Please tell people about us. And on behalf of uh, a gentleman who I'll ask to identify himself, Greg, where are you, Greg? Uh, the gentleman who's hand up would love to send you one of our second-hand books. And we use the funds to, to uh, assist Rusi. I'd like to also acknowledge that we recently had a massive donation from the personal library of one of our previous presidents, um, Brigadier Phil Carey. Uh, Phil died and his family bequeathed the bulk of his library collection to us. Where we didn't have it, it's going into our collection. Where we do have it, we offer them for sale uh, to members so that we can benefit. So please check those out. We would really appreciate your support. Our speakers today are the Officer Commanding 81 Wing, uh, Matthew, and uh, the officer in charge of what is now called the Ghost Bat Program, uh, I think officially as from last week, Loyal Wingman was renamed into Ghost Bat, and the publicity that I read about it is that uh, that is uh, the name of a, of a native marsupial or equivalent uh, animal. And Ron Lyons will introduce them properly, uh, you both properly, in a moment. So thank you, gentlemen, very much for being with us. Next month, we have the newly promoted head of Army Aviation speaking to us about what that capability upgrade means for the military. It will be a webcast only because it is the day after Anzac Day. And as such, we made the judgment that there'd simply be too much on to ask you to also attend Anzac Day and then come to a face-to-face. -face. So that one 
happens to be uh, webcast only. We hope you'll enjoy it. Could I point out that as far as I'm aware, our presenters today have agreed that there will be a webcast version of today and in that sense we hope that it's more widely available. On the 10th of May we have finally agreed or, or Ron has committed and Stowe at Lucas Heights to give us a visit. So on Tuesday the 10th of May the RUSI will be attending and that's a deliberate follow-up to the January presentation by Captain Chris Skinner which was on the OCUS agreement of nuclear propelled submarines. So we would like to link those two. That happens to be the 10th of May. And on the May, and this is the last point that I want to cover, on the uh, final event in May, I hope that many of you have booked for the commemorative uh, harbour tour of the Japanese submarine attack on Sydney Harbour. And we have declared that to be uh, our major Rusi event for that month. My understanding, Ron can flesh out the detail, that basically our booking is full, but there is an opportunity to go to that tour on the next morning uh, because they're running it twice. And we understand that there are still places available on the Wednesday morning tour. We booked the Tuesday morning tour, but the tour itself uh, I did the, the tour about four or five years ago. Can I commend it to you? It is a very, very moving and appropriate experience. I'd like to again thank you for coming. I'd like to acknowledge those people who have helped us today. Can I particularly comment and thank uh, Theo and others who have set up and got us ready, booked the, the lunches, etc. And on behalf of the RUSI New South Wales Board, thank you so much for supporting this event. I'd like to now hand over to our event coordinator, uh, Ron Lyons, to introduce and also to advise that Theo, uh, who is one of our board members, will thank the speakers at the end. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third of our monthly lecture series for 2022. The overall theme for this year of our activities is improving Australia's regional security. And the title of today's lecture is Air Combat Capability, F-35 and the Loyal Wingman Program. It'll be presented by Group Captain Matt McCormack, Officer Commanding 81 Wing, RAF Williamtown, for the F-35, and Group Captain Chris Hake, Program Director, Loyal Wingman Unmanned Combat Air Vehicle Program, RAAF, located with Boeing in Brisbane. Our speakers today have a combined 70 years of service in the Royal Australian Air Force, which has included flying a wide variety of aircraft types, as well as project team work in acquisition, upgrade and evaluation projects. Their operational services included Operational High Road in Afghanistan and Operational Okra in the Middle East. They also have had career postings in command, training, staff and foreign exchange areas. As Michael said last week, the Loyal Wingman program was renamed the MQ-28A Ghost Bat Air Power Tr Teaming System. And as he said, the name derives from a large carnivorous bat which is native to Northern Australia. In view of this, I asked Chris if he would need any adjustment to the lighting in here, but he said no, that was fine. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome our first speaker, Group Captain Matt McCormack. Professor Howe, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk to you today. Uh, Matt McCormack, I'm from 81 Wing. 81 Wing uh, is, consists of four flying units and they all have F-35s in them. Uh, we have 48 aircraft in Australia currently and that will increase to 72 by the end of 2023. The original purpose of the discussion today was to talk about how we are putting F-35 and GhostBat together in air teaming for the strategic uh, purposes for the defence of Australia. I too am fascinated at how we are going to achieve that because we are not quite there yet. So. We're going to take a slightly different juncture 
and I will talk to you about F-35 and then Hacker on the right will talk to you about Ghostbat. There is a lot of bad press about F-35. As someone who flies the F-35, I would like you to know that it is an amazing aircraft. It does things so much better than the classic Hornet which I used to fly. It gives us such an advantage in the battle space, it is unbelievable. Unfortunately, that is the level of discussion that we can talk about it because the nature of the F-35 and the fact that we have purchased it from the United States in fact, almost all of the information that sits within the bubble and the life cycle of the F-35 is at a higher classification level. So what I will do for you today is I will give you a system description of what the F-35 is, what benefit it brings to the fight, and then I would hope that there would be an engagement where you get to ask some questions about what it actually means and how we would employ it, and I will discuss that in question time throughout. That's hacker. So the first thing that obviously jumps out at you with F-35 is that it's stealth characteristics and it's low observable nature in the X-band of the spectrum. So it's shaped like a stealth fighter, it looks like a stealth fighter, only a little fatter, but that is the first thing that jumps out at you. But that is not what is special about the F-35. It is a fifth generation aircraft, and what does that mean? It means the next logical step in technology past the fourth generation is the easiest way to say it. But it's not what it looks like on the outside is what makes it special, although that is one of the defining characteristics of it. The things that actually make it a fantastic weapon system is the way that it fuses its five main sensors and gives the pilot in command the maximum amount of situational awareness that you can achieve so that they can employ lethal effects on the battle space as required by the government. So I've listed up the five major sensors on the aircraft. They start with the radar, which is up the front. It's an electronically advanced, um, electronically scanned array at the front, the APG-81, and we call it the multifunction array. It gets a lot of information through sending electronic energy out and bringing it back and then that goes into the brain's trust that is the fusion engine on the F-35. It combines information with the electro-optical targeting system. What does that mean? It's a forward-looking infrared. It is a uh, infra inf infrared search and track. It's a laser spot tracker and it has a laser inside it so that it can actually target things on the ground and employ laser-guided weapons. It has a distributed aperture system, which is a bunch of six cameras located around the aircraft, which gives you 360-degree mid-wave IR view of what is going around the aircraft as another way to define entities that are in the battle space. It has a very advanced electronic warfare suite. When you look at the picture that's up there, these yellow bits on the leading edges and on the tips and on the trail, they are all flush-mounted antennas that are able to sense the electronic environment and then determine what is out there and hopefully where it is and then to display that information to the pilot. And finally, the CNI or the Communication, Navigation and Identification Suite that it has on board performs a number of functions to not only tell everyone that on the blue good side that I am friendly, but it also uses some very smart electronics to try and identify other entities that are out in the battle space so you can tag them as being good or bad. All that together by itself though must cohesively come together in a fused picture, otherwise it's just a fourth gen aircraft. So the thing that actually makes the aircraft fifth gen is what Lock Lockheed Martin called their fusion engine. So this is a tightly held secret by Lockheed Martin in the US. They hold very close to their chest the intellectual property of how this actually works. 
And I've given a simplified diagram of what it is here, because if I go into any more detail, A, I don't understand it because I'm a pilot, and B, they don't tell us the nitty gritty details of it anyway. The purpose of the fusion engine is to allow the environment around the F-35 to be identified and classified to things that are of greater priority to the survival of the aircraft. So it is moderately interested in things that are very far away. It is really interested in things that are closer to the aircraft so that you can then afford more sense of time to those entities to try and get a combat identification of what that particular entity is. That's important if you're going into harm's way. You obviously care about things that can harm you so that they can be positively identified. So you can either run away bravely or you can go and dispense justice on an adversary in the battle space. So information comes from off-board. Off-board mean through one of those sensors. It brings it in, that information comes into the fusion engine. Off-board information can also come through the communication, navigation and identification system, which is a link information network that is Link 16, which is common throughout the majority of the Western forces. But it also has a separate independent information network called MADL, Multifunction Advanced Data Link. That is bespoke to F-35 only, and that is a low probability of intercept, directional, high bandwidth information flow, so that information that is gathered from my aircraft is immediately shared with my three other wingmen, and then the four other aircraft on either side if I'm of a larger formation as well. So that shares that information. Because they are all part of the F-35 community, it will inherently trust that information more than it trusts the information coming across the other network, which is Link 16, given the veracity of the types of information and the accuracy of the information that comes across the network from that. Sensors and network, information comes in to the fusion engine and then it goes through a process, basically like an OODA loop, and then starts to assess whether is this difficult for me? Is this going to make my life uh, painful? And what fidelity of information do I have on that? If it identifies something that is dangerous, that I have defined previously, and I'll get to that shortly, as bad, it will likely afford more time of the suite of sensors to improve the uh, confidence that that entity is actually that bad actor that is in the airspace. It will go through that system, it will then give that information back out to another F-35, it will give that information back out to other friendly forces on Link 16, and then, most importantly, as far as I'm concerned, it gives a fused picture of the battle space to the single pilot in command of the aircraft. And it will display that in a simplistic fashion, because we are simplistic people and we like colours. This is an example of half of the panoramic cockpit display that we have in the F-35 and the purpose of this is to show you that entities that are out there that it is able to detect and identify will then go through the fusion engine combined with the intelligence information we have equipped the aircraft with prior to flight. It will determine whether it is a friendly, a neutral, an unknown or a hostile actor and then it will display that on the tactical situation display so that you can then affect it and fly your best tactics for whatever the purpose and mission of the day is. There is a lot of information that is displayed to the pilot. I would like to say that it is as crisp and clean as this information where red represents bad, white represents unknowns and green represent friendly. However, I'm sure many of you have a good understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum and it is congested. The majority of fighter air intercept radars are in our band that is, works best for identification. So that means all our fighter radars are in that band. And oh, by the way, the majority of adversary radars are in that band. So being able to determine the difference between 
an electronic um, spectrum information alone makes it quite difficult, which is then where the rest of the sensors come into it. So you can get different types of ID uh, to improve the confidence that that entity is correctly identified. I briefly talked earlier about the intelligence information that we feed into the aircraft. The Australian and UK services have signed up to a reprogramming laboratory for the F-35, where we harvest inf intelligence information from the Five Eyes database. We then have Australian and uh, United Co Kingdom folks to actually put that information into a mission data file, which is the attempt to be able to allow the fusion engine to make sense of what's in the environment. And it pains me greatly but the F-35 system is not simply about the aircraft. It is about the critical supporting elements that allow the aircraft to go and do what it does. And there are various other areas. At the very top there, I've put security. This aircraft only operates at the highest classification level. The way we protect the information that we have been given privileged access to by the US is to ensure that that is kept close hold and there are very robust facilities that are used to make sure we keep that information close to our chest. The advantage that that gives us is that then our adversary doesn't know what we can do well and what we can do poorly and then they aren't able to take advantage of what we don't do so well because there is no perfect weapon system out there. Going around in a clockwise direction then we have the intelligence analysts that not only provide us a good situational awareness of what we can expect to see when we get airborne, but they are able to ingest into the mission data files the specific information for the particular area that we are fighting in for that mission. Mission support is a magic art whereby we have specialists that do nothing else every day put together the mission information required so that when you press the start button on the jet, the millions of lines of code work as they are required to work and there are no errors in the system. The off-board information system centre, more than just a mouthful, that is a place that we have separated from the main running system of the F-35 where we are able to test in a sand pit new release software that comes out from the Joint Program Office in the US we can test it out in the Australian environment to make sure it works and there's no glitches with it before we insert that software into the weapon system that is F-35. I've briefly talked about mission data files and ALICE, as it is unaffectionately known, is the computer system that does all the maintenance, training, learning, logistics for the F-35 which is a bespoke Lockheed Martin software system. As you can imagine, we think in Australia that we do things pretty well. This is designed by Americans and they are not all the time willing to look at more efficient ways to do things, but it is the system that we have, so we must learn to work with it. And then finally, the maintenance technicians that, keeps the, that keep the jets up in the air there has been a shift in the specialisation of those trades from fourth generation aircraft to fifth generation aircraft. Low observable material maintenance is an example of that, which is new to us in Australia. Thankfully, we are part of a global partnership for F-35, which allows us to learn from lessons that other services have observed and identified, and then they pass those lessons to us so that we can become better at maintaining the F-35 from a global program perspective. Did I lose anyone? Probably did, but that's okay. Before we go into questions, however, I'll hand over to the gentleman on the right of the slide, Chris, and he's, he'll talk to you about the GhostBat program. Um, thanks. Uh, very uh, welcome opportunity to come and speak to Rusty New South Wales, Professor Howe. Thank you very much. For, uh, thank you very much for the invite. And uh, Mac, thanks for warming everyone up for me with uh, 
the world's most expensive ever fighter aeroplane. Okay, I'm going to just, uh, again, sort of emphasise what a pleasure it is to be able to come speak to uh, Rusi. We're just going to describe the MQ-28A uh, Boeing Air Power Teaming System uh, vehicle to you. Uh, and we'll go through uh, what it is, what our goals are, particularly we'll emphasise the industry part because we technical capabilities can be classified, but we're really pleased with the industry uh, bit. And then maybe a little bit about uh, you know where we're going with it. We'll finish off with a couple of uh, videos, all authorised for uh, public release. So, yes. So this is a, a fantastic Australian story. You know, the first time in uh, well over 50 years that uh, Australia's built a combat uh, aeroplane. And Australia's also reaching in and building a novel, new, uh, tautological uh, combat system. No one else, it, everyone's trying to do it. Uh, no one else has actually successfully achieved this yet. And you can read what it's up there. This is a disruptive system. It is a collaborative arrangement between industry led by Boeing Defence Australia as the prime, and uh, they have a range of uh, suppliers and subcontractors, and the Commonwealth, Air Force Headquarters and Capability Acquisition Sustainment Group. So we're trying, we are trying to have a joint enterprise here, Team Australia approach to this. And uh, while I'm constrained on what we can say about the vehicle, it is, uh, obvious what we're trying to do here is build into our system and everyone has this problem now affordable mass in an attributable system we need numbers you can have the uh, best uh, fighters in the world or platforms in the world but they can't be everywhere and they can't be everything like the starship enterprise is a fantastic starship but there's only one of it and kirk can't solve everyone's problems simultaneously we will be out there in mass. Uh, we will be teaming with uh, crewed platforms. Um, what we can see here is uh, are two of our flight test vehicles and uh, down there up and away, I think that was the first flight where we raised the undercarriage and uh, undergoing some envelope expansion. I was kind of um, interested to see some commentary on LinkedIn after we had the ghost bat announcement that some of the uh, Female engineers commenting on it thought that that was like uh, lipstick and nails were matching on the aeroplane, which I thought was a nice take on the uh, flight test orange. So the go with the actual uh, air vehicle itself is it provides uh, the right point in the uh, flight envelope, affordable fighter-like performance that is a polite participant with uh, other jet air vehicles out there and the altitude and uh, speed and ranges um, are fighter-like. Now, if you want to build a fighter and you don't let requirements stay constrained, you are going up with a minus four plus nine G jet that uh, pulls, uh, can carry uh, you know, multiple uh, heavy weapons and then it ends up being a very expensive heavy aeroplane and then hang on, the point was to build an affordable a tritable aeroplane that we can send out into the battle space to team with vehicles. So we're not trying to replicate what other crewed vehicles do. We're not trying to be an F-35, we're not trying to be an F-18 or a Growler. We're trying to fill a niche and do things that those vehicles can't or do risky missions that we don't want to put those platforms into that sort of risk environment. The good thing about it, 2,000 nautical miles range. Uh, the design's holding up very well in test compared to the digital modelling. And the key, of course, is it's autonomous. It is not flown like a, an ARPAS, a Reaper, or some of the other um, unpiloted vehicles uh, with one-to-one -one and someone's driving the thing around, whether it's with a joystick and throttle or with a keypad. It's autonomous. It's told what its mission has to be, and it goes off and does it with a human as a custodian. So you might have a team of these, and it's using its artificial intelligence to go out there and achieve the mission under the guidance of whatever crewed vehicle it's teaming with. And uh, that can uh, be a fighter. It could be uh, one of our other big wing platforms shown here, like the uh, E7 Wedgetail. The artificial intelligence is effectively doing what 
a human pilot in the system would do. Um, without cognitive limits, I think I'm ripping off uh, Terminator here, it will never sleep, it will never tire, it will never grumble, it will never make a mistake, it will do what it's told, um, it will never um, show any fear, it will do what it's programmed to do and it will uh, come back or not. The other thing I want to emphasise, this is not uh, like a Terminator cyborg however. The first priority for us is this is a safe platform. It can work safely in the airspace with other, other vehicles. The second is we ensure that it's an ethical vehicle and its behaviours are ethical. And we have uh, um, a research centre, I think I'll get this right, Trusted Autonomous Systems Research Centre, um, partially funded by the uh, Commonwealth, to make sure that we are analysing its behaviours and they are ethical and follow the laws of armed conflict. And uh, then the third thing we get to is it's tactically effective in terms of the, pro the uh, behaviours. The idea of this thing as well, uh, the payloads contained in a module in those section, um, we can't disclose what the sensor packages will be and the sensor package packaging can be flexible. Um, it can do those types of things. You can speculate what they might be. I won't confirm or deny it. The other thing is that if we have an export customer, they can package up their own sensors in there. We intend to keep the construction, design construction test of this thing in Australia, but the intention is also to let sovereign customers have access to a development kit where they can put their own payloads in the nose and get after their particular missions using their own sovereign uh, sensors. The other thing about it, that we're doing this in Australia, we can do a line level reconfigure the nose, but just take a one step back, we are in control of the sensor package. We learn how to do the engineering, we can engineer a new sensor in, and the, uh, having that in Australia means we can do it rapidly, we can stay a step ahead of the threat. So if a new sensor becomes available to us, it has improved performance, or we want to do new software that improves the performance of the sensor package, we can do that rapidly in Australia and we're talking months, not years. And if talking about modifying behaviours, we're talking days, not months. And that ability to get inside an opponent's uh, decision loop and respond to the threat um, is very important to us and one of, the, uh, one of the key factors about it, which is like not wholly technical, it's kind of organisational, but super important to us. And as I said, really really good news story about uh, Australian industry and uh, as I was talking to some people earlier um, I can, I, I'm based up in Brisbane um, we have a, the manufacturing site down in Melbourne, there's parts of it in Adelaide uh, and there will be a final assembly plant in Wellcamp in uh, Queensland but I can walk down along the uh, rows of desks there and see the young engineers who have been brought on board and we're bringing on new people uh, within Boeing every week and see them actually on the computer-aided design models designing the next generation of vehicles. You know, every day they're doing piece parts. You know, uh, designing an air vehicle is a complex undertaking, and uh, that's happening in real time right now today um, with a team of engineers which is growing uh, every day, and we eventually have uh, added another 200 jobs in just inside Boeing and probably uh, nearly as many as that out in the supplier base as well. So that's a really good uh, job and a really good news story. Unlike a lot of other programs, and we do lean on uh, foreign uh, entities for some of the uh, defence equipment, a great deal of defence equipment we buy, 70% of the value of this uh, system is Australian industry. That's uh, real jobs and real money in Australia. It says 100 plus jobs there, the size of the enterprise will be 300 plus inside uh, Boeing and uh, I think 200, at least another 200 out in the supplier base there in Australia. The suppliers are uh, listed there. The other thing about it, this also punches a few buttons with our sovereign industry capabilities. Um, advanced signal processing, test and evaluation, because it'll be tested in Australia um, as a joint enterprise with the Commonwealth and Boeing. Uh, surveillance and intelligence, and most obviously, um, the future robotics and autonomous systems. So this is an autonomous air vehicle. I think if you keep an eye to the, uh, an eye to the press, defence press, you'll see that many uh, overseas services and Australian services are now pursuing autonomous undersea vehicles, or some autonomous surface vessels, autonomous systems for uh, land use as well. 
and this is uh, part of getting on board with it in the uh, aviation arena. So you know, it's really exciting. I, I go to work there and um, walk down through the um, engineers there at BDA in Brisbane, and I just get the feeling it must be what it must have been like working on Apollo. You know, it's inspiring. Everyone is super pumped about getting this done and motivated. And, um, everyone there, whether they're doing the ground control system, doing some computer-aided design of the airframe, cutting code for the behaviours and software or sensors, you know, they're super motivated uh, to get after it. And uh, it is just really inspiring, and I hope you get a sense of that from you know, the tone in my voice here, uh, just what an exciting program this is for industry. And to think you get a young engineer involved here designing it, he's an aviation engineer, an aero, or a software engineer, designing something that's going to be designed built, assembled, flown in Australia, which could be a multi-billion dollar export opportunity for us. <laughs> Wasn't sure if the sound would come up in the video. I just want to say on that one, I was asked at lunch there, what's the future in this? How are we going to evolve it? And the important thing is that we are learning how to do this in Australia with Australian people. Uh, we are leveraging off the experience that uh, Boeing and industry have in defence uh, and autonomy. But once we know how to do it and we evolve this vehicle, we can use the digital design and learning the digital design and the digital stack and how to, how to do that. A lot of this is done in modelling and simulation um, so we understand the airframe, the structure, the behaviours, the payloads. Once we can do that, then you can scale it. You know, are we going to build a bigger one with a bigger engine, a bigger wing? I don't know, but uh, you have to learn how to do things uh, before you can build outwards. So we're at a, in the early stages of this. This vehicle will continue to evolve um, I'm confident, because we've got some really brilliant engineers and people involved, this will continue to evolve ahead of the threat. It's novel. We don't know exactly how this will fit in with the F-35, as Max said, but I know that it will. And I don't know how it will fit in with uh, our other crew platforms either, but I'm very confident that it's got a role to play, and our young aviators and warfighters um, are going to be able to take advantage of this as a brilliant new tool or a new technology that can help them with the uh, mission there. I mentioned the digital engineering thread, and it is all digital, which reduces your uh, design test feedback loops by about 90%. So this is an agile digital program, much like they would do inside SpaceX and some of these modern digital uh, fields, uh, with vastly reduced time to market, time to build. Um, we've developed this aeroplane to where it is now for a very small percentage of what you would use with traditional methods and in a very, very short time frame. We intend to evolve it on biannual cycles uh, with major generational changes and improvements in performance. It's disruptive. Um, it's going to be a new way of employing air power because we've got a new tool set for uh, the manned aeroplanes or crewed aeroplanes, if you like, to push assets forward um, and to help them with their mission. We also don't have a very large logistic footprint. So when it comes to basing, can I operate this thing off short runways? Yes. Can I operate off flat, short stretches of road? Yes. Can I be independent of the air base and be out in the field somewhere massively targeting the idea of interdicting or denying use of an airfield uh, because you know those things can be in reach of opponents' uh, air power and or missile power. So it's a different way of doing it and it doesn't need a big support base. There's no pilots to feed for one thing. Um, and, uh, you know, we can launch it and put it into the battle space from uh, very short uh, airstrips, although it is not a Stovall or VTOL aeroplane. Future evolution will happen we're using the best ideas from within our warfighters, from taking in the intelligence data we get from threats and integrating that as a sovereign capability 
to do what's best uh, for Australia and for our alliance uh, partners. So uh, I'm very confident of that and we'll be able to do that affordably and in the numbers we need. We will not be a Death Star, we will not be everything to everybody, we'll be filling a particular affordable, attributable niche. So I'll just... This was put together by Boeing, so uh, the standard caveats apply. They own it all, and if anyone says anything, Boeing lawyers will come for you. Ghostbats the name for the Australian vehicle, export vehicles don't get the Australian name, they get Boeing Air Power Teaming System, according to the Boeing lawyers. So, we're very happy to take any questions. Oh, there's a question about engine, I think, from down the back there, was it? Hi, Paul. My question is addressed to Ghostbats. Looks impressive up there. I reckon that Ghostbats is going to be the US Parts to that. Uh, some statements by Secretary of uh, Defence there, or Secretary of USAF, Frank Kendall, I think at their conference a few weeks ago, where he did call out the need for uncrewed systems that can team with their combat platforms, and I think he called out the Boeing air power teaming system specifically. So he was talking about uh, a system of systems that can team with their tactical fighters and some kind of uncrewed platform still undisclosed, maybe conceptual, I don't know, I know what Secretary Kendall said, uh, which would team with the B-21. Uh, again, for the same reasons, that it adds mass and it reduces risk to combat crews. Because I can uh, build another uh, loyal wingman in a month, it takes five years to get a five-year experienced fighter pilot. So that answers the question there about what the, U the US's intentions are, as stated by Secretary Kendall. They are extremely interested in the autonomy piece 
Uh, and you know, if you've been tracking it, they have the Skyborg program, which has been running for a number of years, which the Boeing Air Power Team system, um, to the best of my knowledge, has not been a part of. But, so they're looking at a whole bunch of options from very uh, light, small, cheap, short range things, because to get range you need to be big, unless you've got some magic, um, up to quite high end things. And I think something that can accompany a B-21 thousands and thousands of miles is going to be quite a large aeroplane, just because of the laws of physics. Um, so that's the question there. A trittable because it hasn't got a human in it. Um, we do need to have cost as a factor for an attributable aeroplane. No one wants to have a hundred million dollar aeroplane that you buy a thousand of and then throw 500 away. I mean, it's like the old Pentagon aphorism, you know, a billion dollars here and a billion dollars there and pretty soon you're talking real money, right? So we don't, we have to keep price as a factor. That is not to say for specific missions or specific needs, maybe you do build a higher end platform and the president of Kratos in the, uh, or might have been the chief executive of Kratos in the United States, talk specifically about, well, maybe not every aeroplane I build is a trittable. This is Kratos' position, so I'm quoting him, I'll build some that have some exotic sensors that are there to do a specific non attributable mission. So it's about risk to crew, risk to mission, and um, you can push it forward without putting your people at risk. We are conscious of a price point. That doesn't mean that that is the whole answer. Three, the evolution of the vehicle. I do believe if you look at every single aviation program since the Wright brothers that the aeroplane gets more propulsion, more fuel, more range and more payload. And it starts with the Wright flyer and you work out from there. doesn't matter if it's the Mustang, the Hornet, the Super Hornet, um, the B-52, uh, you know, they grow and weight growth is a thing. We need to learn how to do it with this vehicle. Once we can replicate that, we can use the digital engineering tool, tools to scale it if we so choose to do so. And you know, that might be something we do choose to do so because in my view, the Pacific is still really big, not getting smaller. Paul? Okay, thank you. Christina, uh, Chrissy. Uh, question on the five. Very impressive uh, title mission uh, integration. Does the F 35 already have the necessary two way communications to control and monitor? Uh, the uh, ghost bat uh, and possibly modern ghost bats. The interesting thing, or for me, the interesting thing about the F 35 radios is it actually has one traditional box radio that acts like a radio like we would know. The three other radios that work simultaneously and at the same time are actually software defined. So it actually shapes to propagate energy in that particular waveform instead of actually having a hard, pre-made radio in a warehouse that you put into the aircraft and then you need to take it out if it breaks or you need to replace it if you need to upgrade. So software-defined radio, radios is where it's at with the FB5. Currently, we don't use any of those radios to control something that we don't know where it's going to go to. We are still under development for the Ghost Bat, with me, I'm all knowledgeable now, for the Ghost Bat. I would suggest, however, that because it is software defined, it's a matter of ones and zeros to make those shape those waveforms as required to pass the correct and volume of data required to control whatever is out there. And that might be done at the uh, aircraft research and development unit in Victoria, perhaps. Uh, they put some very smart people down there to do that. Yes. I'll just add the air. Our Autonomous system has been uh, designed and engineered to interface with our crewed platforms without requiring any major changes to the existing platforms as uh, what we call a polite participant. Max Wilson, Chrissy. Max is opening remarks. Uh, he said that this aircraft, the 35, is coming for a lot of bad publicity. Ignoring cost overruns
fuel in the contested environment of the modular for various reasons. I would suggest to you that as someone who operates the weapon system um, and as part of a community that look to get the nth degree out of everything that we're operating for maximum advantage, internally we are driving to make the F-35 in concert with the rest of the global partnership of F-35s as good as it can possibly be. And like Hacker has just talked about, it will evolve over time. I may suggest that those individuals who throw spears at the F-35 and actually do not think it is competitive against what we see in the open source media of potential adversary aircraft, they actually don't know what the system is. I have not explained to you the nuts and bolts of the system today because there is a security architecture around it, which I've talked about. Anyone who is talking about this in the open press doesn't know what that is. And so they are making assumptions. A lot of assumptions out there are based on physics and the shaping of the low observable nature of the aircraft. And you can do that. You can make assessments based on that. But as I talked about, the fundamental reason the F-35 is a fifth generation aircraft is the fusion of all those different sensors to increase awareness, to allow effectiveness and survivability in the outer space. I'll uh, ask Lucy if I might not ask both of your questions starting with F 35. Um, having worked on maintenance systems for the Navy, am I allowed to ask if the F 35's maintenance system is uh, mission based? Would you like to see your mission based or mission based? Yeah. So, I don't understand the question. Okay. So, um, if you were doing a flight that did not involve uh, um, a refueling for a short distance and one that did involve refueling, obviously you have uh, different distances, would you be able to plan your maintenance based on the different missions? Uh, because we're such a small air force, that, uh, we have small numbers of air vehicles, you turn for an aircraft, uh, we have a small number of pink bodies in the front seat to operate those aircraft. Our philosophy is that we train and operate to conduct all missions at any one time. So the maintenance workforce looks to reach a baseline of mission capability state for the air vehicle, which means that we can affect any of those missions required with the way the air vehicle is being maintained by our maintenance workforce. It is not specific. So we do not try to arrive at a situation where we can't do some roles because we've maintained the air vehicle to do these roles. It is a multi-role type platform which can do more roles than the F-18 classic one could do. And we maintain an underlying level of capability to be able to do any of those roles on a moment's notice. We're at the behest of the Australian government and we are called to duty to do what they want to do at any point in time. We do not want to be the Navy and say, well, we told you we can do this, but we can't do it. So we always are able to achieve all the roles. Yeah, no, thank you. And my question for the Fox Bay is that I've worked in uh, defence uh, software development. I uh, just wanted your response to my assertion um, that the Fox Bay will make mistakes because it's programming what human beings. We uh, have an ability to do a lot of like thousands and thousands of simulations with Monte Carlo's in the digital system analysis lab so before that code gets out into the wild it's actually been really well and truly flogged in the lab to make sure and this was a whole bunch of injects you know the environmental noise Monte Carlo's for unexpected things happening where we are confident that the behaviours will be satisfactory. The other thing that sits over the top of it, like many of these autonomous systems, is a thing called runtime assurance, which is basically fences in how much the artificial intelligence can do. So it can make a mistake, but it'll eventually run up against, I can't go any further, go back, get, metaphorically, get back in your box, AI. So it's not just unfettered AI where we all end up hiding in the hills, being chased by giant chrome robots, right? That's not how this works. It'll be a limited set of AI based on a, a thing which I don't fully understand, but perhaps you do if you work in software, this runtime assurance overlay. And the digital simulation we get in, we 
uh, must do before it gets into the wild. So I'm not a software guy, but that's how I understand it. On behalf of IUSI and everyone here today, I'd like to thank both Matt and Chris for taking uh, time and effort and presenting an extremely informative and extremely um, worthwhile presentation. We've uh, picked up on a lot of information on both on the Ghost Bat and the F-35s and the uh, Loyal Wingmans, as they previously were called. Um, uh, what I took some notes, as everybody does when they do this sort of thing, um, <laughs> but... Um, what I found interesting was that it's technology that we're not necessarily going to know or understand completely, as both our presenters have said. So I jotted down fusion engine, electro electromagnetic spectrum, autonomous log logistics information systems, Americans and how they operate, disruptive and rapid operational configuration. And it keeps going on. But I did understand the Enterprise and the Death Star, so thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, we have a tradition to thank our presenters because you make a huge effort. So we uh, present you with um, these most uh, beautiful ties that uh, people in the street will stop you and ask you where you got them from. Um, and interestingly enough, um, both our presenters picked a different colour tie, so it's good, good on you. And, uh, but what's more important is uh, we present you with 12 months honorary membership of RUSI New South Wales. Um, we believe that uh, you'll benefit from this through our networking system, through the library, um, and through um, uh, the news, uh, news information that you'll pick up from us. And hopefully, um, through that time, you'll tell your colleagues about us, and when the 12 months are up, you'll join up again. So thank you very much for your, for your time.